Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk, Closure's Emerging Data Ecosystem, an incomplete tour at the REPL. My name is Ethan, and I'm here with Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Hey, Ethan. So I'm a full stack developer. I currently work at primary.com, a company that makes uh, bright and simple clothing for children. Uh, I also, in the last few years, have been uh, involved in helping to organize the SciClosure community, which is a community devoted to improving working with data with closure and um, also educating people about these tools and trying to be as inclusive as possible in terms of getting people involved. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Sammy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm currently also <clears throat> mostly a developer. I work with a company in Sweden called KP System. We develop tools for municipalities, kind of map map based tools. It's all on closure. I'm also the founder of 8 Chief, which is a consultancy. We do all kinds of things around data. I, I have also been busy with Cyclosure for a couple of years now, helping organize stuff and, uh, and things like that. Uh, Ethan, do you want to talk uh, a little bit about the, uh, what we actually want to do today, why we're here actually today? Yeah, our goal today is, is essentially to showcase some of the libraries and emerging data ecosystem for Clojure. Uh, we want to show what it's like to work with them, how they fit together, uh, and give you know a sense of what it's like to, to work with data in Clojure. We've called this an incomplete tour at, at the REPL because we aren't you know, by any means showcasing all of the libraries that are available. There's many wonderful libraries that we won't have a chance to work with, uh, but we've tried to select some that are commonly used and, and central to doing data science. Yeah, and, uh, and we're going to do it by actually working with some real data. We'll talk more about it in a second, what it actually entails. But yeah, trying to sit by the REPL, show some libraries and work with some real data. Should we get to it? Yeah, let's jump in. So, so we also already have a, a little bit of a start of a buffer here. I'll just start evaluating. Ethan, feel free to explain a little bit what we're seeing here now. Sure. So what we've got here already is just some setup getting started. We are right off the bat requiring a few libraries. The library here is called NodeSpace. And NodeSpace allows us to work in the buffer, but also, as you can see on the left of the screen, get some sort of visual tools that allow us to look at the data more, more conveniently. And uh, we're going to be working with this tool throughout the session today, so you'll become quite familiar with it. Right now, I think you can maybe demonstrate simple form of what it looks like and how it works, right, Sammy? Yeah, so we just have this range 10, and immediately after we, we have uh, evaluated it, it, it shows here in the last eval. And actually, when we go here and we save the file, the whole buffer, now we haven't gone through all of this yet, but everything that we have in this buffer here can be seen here now. This is sort of a notebook aspect of node space. Sure. And yeah, so we preloaded the data into the computer here. I load it here. Ethan, you want to say a few words about what we're actually loading in? What is this data with this? Yeah, so this is data that uh, Sammy pulled from the Clojurians Zulip API. It's message data, uh, conversations that uh, the Cyclosure community has had on the Zulip platform. And in its raw form, it's a, a sequence of maps. So we can actually take a look at one of those and look at what's, what, what's inside. You can start to see how the node space context is useful because we have a nice presentation on the left. What you see there is a map with a bunch of different keywords, and, and this is the data. And we might want to pause here, right, just to talk a little bit about the connect the data to the, the actual UI that we use in Zulip, right? So many people may be familiar with Slack, and Zulip is, is similar, but it has one at least one important difference, which is that within a given channel or stream, as it's called in Zulip, conversations are broken down into middle tier category of topics within which messages occur. So within a stream, you have individual topics, and then the messages and the conversations happen within those topics. And if we look back at the data, we can sort of connect this. What we have here is a single message. This map represents a single message. It's within the stream data science. And the topic is called here a subject. And we can see that right there. And in this case, this is a message occurring in the, sub in the topic, hello. So that's you know that's kind of a, a rough description of the data we're working with here. Sorry if I missed. Maybe you said it already, but the, the message lives here under the content. Key. Right, the message content is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I did miss that actually. Yeah. yeah, well, so I think what we want to do is start to explore our data a bit more. And um, yeah, before before we can do that, one thing we may want to do is is think about e extracting some ideas out of the the basic data we have. Uh, so a kind of uh, feature generation. How can we take you know some of the information like the timestamp uh, or, or the content and other pieces of data that we have already and define some other 
characteristics of each message. Uh, one place to start that's sort of um, straightforward is we have a timestamp, but maybe we can identify uh, other characteristics in terms of time of each message. For example, what hour did it occur? What year? What day? And so on. Um, and we can use tablecloth to add additional columns to the data set we have already. I believe we can use a emerging library that I've worked on a little bit called Tablecloth Time, you know, which has some convenience functions for modifying dates and extracting components at a time. Uh, so that might be one place to start. And then we can think about other features to work on, like, you know, can we can we extract pieces of information about the content? For example, sentiment. Can we think about how the, the messages are related to each other? Is the next response a rapid response? Is each message part of an active conversation or is the conversation sort of limping along? That's true and that fits well in a kind of a larger scenario. Often in data science, you have a few few steps. You start with wrangling, what you were actually describing, the feature generation, wrangling. After that, you explore, you try to learn about the data and then um, sometimes you continue with, with prediction and we hope, of course, to show so at least something of all those. Before we do that, is it okay if we just look some very basic data about this data set that we have here now? We can see oh, some, yeah, that's a good yeah, yeah. yeah. So tablecloth shape is a nice little utility that so show the um, size of it. 18,000 messages. 18,000 messages and five five keys. Let's look at one of these, one of these, um, let's just look at the first message. Um, yeah, that might be nice if we're just taking the first one. We can and we can use tablecloth rows to do that, but specify that we want a map instead of a data set row output for convenience. Like this. Now here we can see the first message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can parse HTML in our heads. Um, let's also quickly look at uh, what do we want to know. We have we know now that we have eighteen thousand you said messages. Let's check the amount of people we have. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, how many side closure ends do we have? You can pull one of the columns just by using the key that the column is, uh, is is named by. Then we put it into a set and we, we get a unique number of uh, users and then we count. Yeah, so that's, let's okay. save that. So we have a... so this is just very basic, basic stuff, of course. But OK, so we know we have 18,000 messages. We have uh, almost 250 users. Um, yeah, we don't know that much more currently, right? Right. Uh, to find out more, to do more exploration, we need to start creating more columns, right? Should we start doing that? Yeah, so uh, now we can maybe think about looking at what it would be like to start uh, adding additional columns to our data set in order, to, in order to build out additional features and characteristics of each message. So uh, one place to start might be to uh, extrapolate uh, some of the features of the time um, so let's let's try to add a column to our data set using tablecloth. And we'll, as you're writing here, we'll use a function called add column. Um, and what we'll, what we can do is let's add a um, uh, we'll, we have a timestamp. Let's convert. Let's add a column just for convenience that expresses the the local date time. So this function it takes the data set uh, as its first argument. And one of the nice things here is we can use the uh, the pipe expression. Uh, to, to transform our data set uh, in a series of steps. So, th so in this case, we're using the pipe. And our second argument is the name of the column, just whatever we want to call it. And now the last argument is a function, which will take the data set as an argument. And then what this function needs to do is generate the column data for this new column. So what we need to do here right, is convert our timestamps to local date time. So we can start with a pipe, another pipe inside this function, and we'll, we'll pipe the data set through. And now we want to select the timestamp column. And now uh, we can map over the values in this, in this column that we've selected. We need to convert our timestamp to local date time. And for that, we can use a function that's in tablecloth time called milliseconds to any time. Do you want to write that out, Sam? Yeah. And this function, it will work. It takes the time. So in this case, we use our special anonymous function argument value, the percent sign. And then we want to specify what we're converting it to. So let's specify that we're converting it to a local date time. And we can use the keywords to do that. So that, that should do it. Um, yes, but you can, you can define these beautiful little tricks because you can define this metadata. And now we have a data set here, uh, if I can spell it. If we're lucky, we, we might see some. Yeah, 
we are. But we okay. were, were not so lucky. I mean, 70s was a good uh, good uh, decade, but, <laughs> but it's not when Cyclos started, I'm afraid. Right, so something's wrong with our date time conversion. I think what happened is that our original data, our timestamp is, is actually in seconds exactly. and not milliseconds. So we need to convert uh, our timestamp before we call the function milliseconds to any time. Multiply, so multiply yeah, with, uh, now, now let's try a lock. OK, that looks better, right? Uh, there is something we could do, right? To, to Because one of the secret sources of tablecloth and uh, uh, the ML data set is that it's super efficient and fast, right? That's right. Underneath the hood, even underneath the ML data set, it's, we have a library called dtype next, which allows us to very efficiently operate on typed data. So because dtype next knows the type of things, uh, it can, it can um, operate very efficiently. And it gives us also some other functions that allow us to do things like mapping very well. So here we've used the regular closure function map, which works, uh, but we end up with a, a column that doesn't, we don't know the type of it. And so that you can get a performance hit. So what we'll use is a function called emap, which allows us to do mappings, but doing it in a way that stays within this world of typed entities. So what we'll do is um, specify here that we're working with an int, an int 64, that there. In our next step, we actually convert a number, an integer, to uh, a local date time, which is a type of entity. And so we'll specify that that's what we're going to get in, in this um, as a result of that. So that we're not going to see any results in the data, but this is the correct way and more efficient way uh, to process, to, you know, to map over a column and to do column transformations. And, you know, I have to say, I, I worked a lot with deep, deep, uh, deplier in R, and th there are some similarities to R is a very sort of ergonomic language, especially the tidyverse. Uh, aspect of it, and and it has also a pipe, and it, it's it's very intuitive and easy to reason about. But I have to say, this is it's actually nicer and cleaner, and it, it's super nice to write, and it's well. What what do you think? Yeah, I agree. This is uh, really fundamental, as we know, the arrow macro is fundamental to the closure language, and here we just can take advantage of it to do the kind of very cons uh, readable transformations of data, where you're kind of layering on more and more information uh, that's related uh, in a way that continues to be extremely readable. Uh, so I, yeah, I really love it. Yeah. OK, so next what we'll do now, because this takes time, and, and even though we, we tried to get an even longer slot, the organizers <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't accept that. So we have to stay within 40 minutes. So a bit like in a cooking show, you know, no, most cooking shows, you don't have to look at the oven for, for an hour or one and a half hours to, <laughs> to see how it. So we, we're going to spare you that part. But we're going to generate some more features. Yes, exactly. And voila, we are ready. So <laughs> fast coders, huh? if you if you need to hire some fast coders, uh, you can find two here. Isna, do you want to sort of start um, describing a little bit more on a high level what, what all this is? Um, this yes, right. So a second ago, we created one single date time column, as you can see on the top. And then we started to derive other features, uh, partly from that, and then a whole bunch of other features, as you can see. Each of these calls is simply an add column call that is it's the same pipe. We're piping the data set through and just adding column after column. So it's a lot, but it's, it's actually really easy to understand. There's not you know sort of a lot of ins and outs. So we can look. Uh, we've, we've packed this new data set we've created with all these columns into a new variable called message with features. And we can look at what our column names are. And generally speaking, we have three. We added three types of features. One we already alluded to, which is we were, you know, creating, we created a date time, and then we thought we could pull out additional time components that might be useful features to explore the data by. Another broad category that we've added are what you could describe as features that capture the flow of the conversation. So one of the things we're interested in is, you know, how active is a conversation? So we've added a bunch of different columns here. One of them, for example, is the next response time. So this is, if I wrote a message, what was the time how quickly did the person who wrote after if somebody did how, how what is the time that it took them to respond so it, it gives us a measure of how quickly people are responding to a given message and from there we've and some other columns we've defined a notion of activeness uh, so that's another broad category of features we added and then finally uh, sammy generated some really lovely um, measures of sentiment based on the message content so these are different types of sentiment, trust, surprise, joy, positivity, negativity, and so on. So yeah, we have a bunch of new features here that are all derived from our initial data that may um, be very interesting to explore and look into. And that's what we're going to do as we move forward.
what do we do next? Next we now we have a kind of we've been we've been wrangling and feature engineering this kind of stuff, and next we want to start to explore this stuff. But uh, I might have to go and sleep in between. It's it's All late, right. late it's here. In, <laughs> but I do I do it quickly. I promise I do it very very quickly. Is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> okay. I'll, sleep, I'll see you. I'll see you in the morning. Okay. So I'm back. I've slept. Uh, Good. I haven't yet. <laughs> no, this this is this is the fun of working in a community like this because now it's kind of a nice Sunday morning here. Um, I'm refreshed. I almost finished the whole pan of coffee. <laughs> but what <laughs> what is it there? You're in close to Seattle, right? Yeah, it's midnight. It's midnight. Oh, so I need to go to bed. But let's do a little bit now. Um, yes. And then we continue on your morning again and my evening, <laughs> right? Exactly. It's kind of yes. like a relay race. Now we want to do some exploration. Yeah, so we'll look at, we'll continue to use tablecloth and tablecloth time, which is a kind of extension uh, of the idea of tablecloth, would provide some additional utilities for thinking about time. Uh, and then this new library, VizCLJ, uh, by Shima Panjawani that gives us a very simple way of uh, generating plots. So, so this is a library, right? That uh, I'll, I'll require them now here first, so we can use them. So the stack is that we're we're actually utilizing Vega Vega Lite, and then there's this beautiful um, library called Hanami, which is a templating engine for Vega Lite in enclosure, which is super powerful. And then this last library that you've been discussing is built on top of that. It just makes sort of quick uh, plotting. Uh, easy, right? That's kind of the value prop of that. Yeah, and you can see a similar pattern here to the uh, to tablecloth and and all the things that are needed. So underneath tablecloth, we have TechML dataset, and underneath TechML dataset, we have dtype next. These things kind of are, become lower and lower level as you go down. But at the top, there's this you know the simplest possible API, uh, and this is sort of the equivalent. It's like a, a similar stack but for visualization. Yeah, and I, I just pasted in a very simple. Random random numbers data set nice. be generated here and, and just to show how it works. First we need to declare uh, if I can type one thing, I mean quickly, maybe we should increase the font. Oh the first thing we need to do is we need to format the data so so we uh, CLJ uh, can deal with it. And then this is kind of the minimum uh, to get something vis visible if we're we're lucky here. And then the next thing we need to do is decide the plot right, the plot type. You can see here, that's why we got this. We required something from the Hanami also, because there's some nice templates, ready-made templates already. But let's just take a basic um, point chart is probably the most basic thing we can do here. When we call the viz function here, it's going to generate the plot, actually. Yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah. If we're lucky, yeah. <laughs> let's do some real. Let's start looking at the data, right? Um, oh, we did all this preparation work, but we haven't. We haven't uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's do a little intervention here. Now it's like, what time is it there? One, almost 1 a.m. <laughs> you need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, all right. But luckily, you don't sleep very long in, in Seattle either. So I'll see exactly. you in just a minute, right? OK, so welcome back, Ethan. Have you have you slept? Did you sleep? Yep, very well. Thank you. you. Slept very well. Good, good. Um, so you're refreshed. I'm, I'm not so much. Reasonably. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's good. We did quite some work, actually, there last uh, uh, this morning, last night for you. Yeah, we were not focused. So we decided we, we'll, we'll rewind a little bit back, right? And, and right. We, we do it again. What, what do we have in mind? What do we want to do next? Yeah, so maybe we could look at the, the message volume over time. Um, yeah, so what we'll do, one of the things, one of the concepts in tablecloth time, if you have a data set, you would set one of the columns as the index. So we'll set the date time column as an index. And then what we can do is modify the, the frequency of this and look at the results. So we can use a, a, a function called adjust frequency that allows us to modify the time series uh, by different sort of groupings. So we, we can start with, let's say, maybe even hours. So what we're doing here is we're saying, OK, we have a time series. Let's kind of summarize it on the hour interval step. And then we just want to do some sort of aggregation. And, this, and essentially, what we're doing is just counting the number of messages at this frequency. Here, we're using tablecots row count as our aggregation function. So you can see that these libraries uh, are designed to work with each other. Uh, and then, yeah, one final step here we ha have to do before we actually uh, use this CLJ to visualize. We need to adjust our, so we can just use a simple operation statement to, to do that. We'll take the partial of um, a map, and uh, that should allow us to convert the column. And then, oh, I, 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 this needs to be a map. Sorry about that. Yes, that's right. Now, yeah. There we go. So yeah. Now we have our aggregations. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then we can plot this. This time we'll, we can use a line chart. So we'll specify that we want to use uh, the Hanami line chart template. And uh, and then we can uh, add some color. So we'll just call viz color and then specify that we want to use the year. Oh, and then we also need to specify what our x and y are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in this case, our x axis will be the time column, or the daytime column, rather. Yes. Great. And with any luck, if we add the viz viz on the end there. No. Oh, no. <laughs> so. Oh, I think, I think we need to specify that the daytime is a temporal yeah. value. Yeah. OK. OK. Now. Right. Wow. So this is kind of interesting because uh, we don't see a lot of shape. We kind of get a sense of the volume. One, one thing that might help would be to kind of, you know, to look at things at a higher resolution of time. So we could increase our frequency to, say, uh, days. Oh, okay. So we're starting to see a little bit of a line there. Let's maybe even move out further. Weeks. Yeah, we can do weeks, ends. Yeah. <laughs> and then feels maybe good. even one more. It does feel good. It feels like we're getting up. It's like things going from being out of focus to in focus. OK. And now now we, yeah, that's cool. So there's kind of one a big peak per sort of year. On 2020, the peak was early in the year. Usually it's around this time. It's, it's actually a lot of work to format the data to get the plots to change the sort of resolution and everything. That's, that's super, super handy. What should we do next? A different plot where we just look at these lines. We can look at the, the, those lines superimposed on each other. And you know, we've kind of pre-prepared that plot here. Yeah, this is interesting. They Very similar. Pretty, pretty similar, yeah. This kind of highlights that, that peak in uh, March, April of 2020 is a little bit unusual because both the 2019 and 21 are sort of on the decline after March yeah. into the summer month. So that's interesting. We did that year, of course, we had our first cyclos conference in Berlin, Energy, but also that was the start of COVID. So may, and, and as I recall, there was some interest in, in talking about the data associated with COVID. That makes sense. It also looks like the summer months, there's always a kind of a slump there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. that's good. Okay, what next? We were talking about, oh, hopefully at the end, we will have time to do some modeling. To do that, it's kind of good practice when you do analysis to split your data into groups. Yeah, so when you, in preparation for doing some sort of machine learning, you need to do a, a split often of your data into a, a testing set, or sorry, a training set, which you use to train your model, and then a test where you, um, you know, you test whether or not your model is predicting the values in the test set very well. Yeah. So we've uh, split the data here, right? And how does it look? Next response time is the time until the next person responded. So it's a kind of measure of, of activity. Here, we're doing a histogram to show the distribution of those values. In the, and we can see that it's quite skewed. Probably we can get a better representation of the, of the actual distribution by normalizing these uh, next response times by taking the log. And that's what we'll do here, right? Yeah, let's 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 do that. But before we do, uh, let's just give a shout out to this. Uh, it's also Chris's library called TechViz. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Um, that we're now using. It's also using Vega in this case to to build this histogram. But it's kind of nice. But now we're using this hiccup thing uh, Ethan was mentioning before and placing these next to each other. Yeah, it makes more sense now. It looks. It doesn't exactly look like a, like a Gaussian curve, but much closer. Next, we could do some more exploration of our, our uh, other features. Exactly. So, so we are interested in the. Let me zoom in a bit, little bit. So, what's going on here, actually? Okay, so we've got in our x column in this first plot and the, the feature that we're interested in looking at, and then we're plotting it against the median res next response time. Kind of some an aggregation that is showing us for the year of 2019 what was the average response to each message. Mm -hmm. And we can see there's quite a big difference uh, in, in the median response time, which is to say an increase in, in active dynamic conversation. Joy. What can we say about That's interesting. joy? We see a little bit of correlation between a more joyful sentiment and, the, and, a, and a quicker response. Yeah. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, but this one's interesting. Joy, joy is good, but positive. But positivity, is... <laughs> yeah. That's... <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Don't don't be too positive. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of boring. You won't get a response. <laughs> yeah, you could imagine if somebody's very angry, you want to stay away. That that's intuitive. Yeah, yeah. yeah here we have the different streams. So yeah. there are yeah there are differences in the different discussion themes. But okay, if you summarize this, we we try to look and find some patterns. It kind of look yeah we we do we do get some insights by this, and there is some connection. It looks like there are some relationships in, in the data, especially in relation to this notion of activeness. Maybe we have a chance of uh, 
modeling something successfully. That's yeah, good. so we, we were doing some more exploration and we found uh, a, a plot that, that looks really promising in terms of thinking about uh, how we might start modeling things. And it's based on what we, the plots we were looking at. What we found here is uh, that if we look at the next response time as a relationship to the response time of the message that were that 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 initiates the the following response time. In other words, if I write a message quickly in response to something else, how likely am I to get a quick response? It's kind of tilted to the right, and so we have a, a kind of linear what looks like maybe a linear relationship. It's the kind of thing that we could model with some sort of linear regression. Yeah. One curious thing to note on this graph is that odd line across the top where it looks like you know there's kind of hat on the data, and that's actually what there is. We put a cap on the longer response times because they there are some outliers. They're relatively infrequent compared to the mass of the data, but this allows us, it's, it's like the log, it's a way for us to kind of remove some data point from consideration uh, in, in order to get a better result. The response time is an interesting variable. It's, let's try this, um, look at the correlation between those two as well. So yeah, we, we see ahead. a relationship in the, in the graph, but we could also measure that uh, relationship with uh, statistically uh, using um, a library called FastMath, uh, which is um, also by the same author of Tableplot. And here we're using a, a function called correlation that gives us what, what's also known as the R value, which is a value that has uh, is, is sort of a range between negative one and one. And when it's negative one, it's a perfect non-negative correlation. Uh, and when it's positive one, it's a per perfect positive correlation. And and uh, and so if we run this statistical measure on the these two the, you know these two variables, we get a, a kind of you know some kind of uh, relationship. It's it's not a perfect one, and we wouldn't want that actually. Uh, but it's um, but it's you know it's 0.5. So it's it, it, there's some some correlation there, and and this means that we may be able to um, see a result if we try to model um, uh, generate a model that can. Uh, predict the next response time as a as a from the response time of the um, the message the current message. So let's go with the um, linear regression because response time is a it's a continuous variable. So then we'll 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 do we go with um, linear regression for that. We're gonna use a tool here called uh, Cycloge ML. Um, maybe you uh, Ethan want to talk about that, and I'll start typing one of these pipelines that you're gonna explain wh how it works. But uh, there's a bit of typing there, so I start. I go ahead already and start some. But yeah, what is uh, Cycloge ML? Cycloge ML is a library by Karsten Baring, and it defines some useful concepts for running models uh, um, and defining kind of pipelines. And the pipeline here, so Sammy has defined a pipe called regression pipe, and then he's calling a function from Cycloge ML called pipeline. And this pipeline function is roughly analogous to the arrow macro in that within the pipeline, we can describe a series of transformations. Um, and, and the first transformation that Sammy's adding is we're not using the TC alias, uh, which was what we used when we were using tablecloth, but we're using MM, which is one of Cycloge ML's namespaces. And these functions have just been modified to essentially do the same thing, but instead of receiving a data set as their first argument, they receive what we call a context. And we'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, but for the moment, we can just think about this, as, you know, essentially the same kind of call that we saw before. Uh, we And so here we're adding two columns. Then we're going to select these columns uh, because that's the only data that we want to feed to our model, which is the end of this transformation. Okay, so now we've selected the columns that we're going to feed to our model, but we need to prepare the the data set so that the model can know what we think we're trying to predict on. So we set the inference target to the log next response time, which is what we're trying to predict. Now here we're adding a kind of special value and it looks like a map. And all we're doing here essentially is saying this keyword model is what we're going to use to look up our results later. And then in our final step, we declare what it is that, that we're going to model with. And we're going to model with the uh, ordinary least square model, which is a linear regression. And um, you should note that also these models that we're using come from Java. So one of the things Cycloge ML does, in addition to giving us the notion of a pipeline, is it allows us to use models that have been defined in this library, Smile, uh, which offers a whole lot of different um, modeling tools. Now here, what Sammy's just pasted in is a really important step. Okay, so now now the we are missing. Oh, we need the percentage. I need to be awake. Uh, I'm I'm focusing more on typing than thinking, but it doesn't help my typing apparently. Yeah, so that's what we did here is we actually we ran this transformation. But let's look a little bit quickly at what it is we actually did there. 
what we did was we, we def in our first step, we defined our pipe. In the second line, we defined a variable regression trained context one. We used our pipeline as a function and we provided it what, with what is called a context. And this context is just a map, it's a map that expects specific, some specific keys. And in this case, it expects, you can see metamorph data, and that's how we give it our data set. And then we also specify the mode. We say that at this point, because we're training our model, we're trying to fit the data, the model to the data. When we call the pipe regression pipe this first time, we call it in the mode fit. So that's how we use a pipeline. And um, we've evaluated it. And now we can use that model keyword that we specified in the pipeline to pull out the model from our trained context. And we can use this explain function to look at the coefficients of our linear, the resulting linear regression. You can see on the left in the node space that this is a, our model has a bias of 1.72 coefficients for the log response time of 0.47. So that looks like a linear regression. And so now we, what we want to do is examine how effective our model is in predicting. So we will now run our pipeline one more time, but this time we're going to run, run it with a different context. So if we look at our uh, what we've done there, we've called the same pipe on our, but this time we're providing it with a modified uh, context. We take the trained context from before, we overwrite the, the metamorph data, we overwrite the data set with our test data, and then we change the mode to transform, which is the predicting mode. And so when we run this, we end up with uh, some predictions. And we can actually look at what those are. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So here we can see the result of our, our transform run. So we have our a series of log response times and then the predicted value of the next response time. And now uh, we can, you know, we can, we can, because we have the actual values and the predicted, we can, we can score this. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so now we have a big bunch of code that we've pre-written that will generate uh, scores, uh, uh, various measures for scoring the data. Like that. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> we got there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't know, Sammy, do you want to explain these different measures? The long and short of it is that this doesn't look very good. Um, so a right. good good model, if you look at the R, R squared uh, numbers, a good model should be close to one or sort of a, like a percentage of how, how big part of the variance is explained. Okay, so here we have for the R squared for the logs, 0.28. It's still not uh, very which good. Which is not good. Yeah. And then for the R squared of the actual values, when we're trying to actually predict the, the response time in seconds uh, with outside of the log, it's point negative point zero four two, so it's it's pretty bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. it looks like um, <laughs> fail. So this was a fail, but no, it's not a fail. We 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 learned something. We were seeing some possible correlations that, that we could use for prediction, but it didn't turn out. We would have to work more on it, but maybe we'll do. I mean, this was the process, but you can use this process for for. Mm, uh, more or less any any model um it's quite standardized so let, let's let's do that logistic one so now we now we have we talk about times length in seconds but we have already done the categorization of of the results as active or non-active and that's of course based on a heuristic that we decided uh, that a certain yeah. amount of seconds uh is 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 fast and and active and after that it's not but let's try that maybe we can get better results there because my intuition is that it, it the problem here is that the um, with the long response times it really breaks the linearity and the, the distribution that we need to be able to use. Um, is it is it okay if we jump to the classification part? And now I'm not going to bore people with typing everything. I'll just copy paste these models um, if that's okay. All right. So we're going to use more pipelines. We're going to define a different pipeline, and this time we'll define a, a classification pipeline. And the model we're going to use, as you can see at the bottom, is a is a logistic regression. So and, and then maybe the other interesting thing here is that instead of using the uh, next response time as our inference target, we're going to use this column called active that we defined, which labels each message as whether or not it's part of an active conversation. We've now trained and then run our test of our classification pipeline. Okay, so now we have a new we have a new function that allows us to to score the the uh, the classification pipeline. And here we're kind of interested in the accuracy. How often did the pipeline, did the model, you know, correctly predict whether or not the conversation is active or not? And so this, I did this uh, this time, and also previously, these these are just kind of convenience functions, so we we can get all the all the numbers 
of the measures into into one nice map like this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so here we have a confusion matrix showing where where we had you know the kind of relationship and then our accuracy measure. Which uh, how would you evaluate that, Sammy? Let's just start by saying that this looks much better. Um, yeah. It's interesting. This uh, confusion matrix is also. Um, Interesting. So let's look at that a little bit. So the false, false, and the true, true are the ones that we uh, are correct ones. They mm -hmm. are the accurate ones. And then we have the um, false positive and false negatives there. And there's there a fair amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's still not. I mean, the accuracy. If we would have in the nineties, I would be um, very happy, blown away. <laughs> but uh, but especially considering that we didn't get much out of the linear regression. I'm pretty happy with this, uh, this yeah. current, considering we that, that we didn't spend a lot of time on doing this. But what we would could do still, uh, if that's OK, Ethan, we, because now we're just using one um, uh, variable, one column or feature to, to do the to feed into the model. Um, so we're not using all the knowledge we have about the message messages to, right. to inform the the model so let's try that still now instead of just the log response time now we're adding a lot of these different features in the hope that that will increase it uh, into something more more interesting maybe there's not so much this is more or less the same we're using a kind of a helper function here one hot coding that's dummy variables where you change categorical uh, var uh, variables into ones and zeros, but we don't need to go into that in this this presentation so much. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same, right, Ethan? Yeah, same basic structure. We've just added some additional columns and transformations that's necessary for them to be understood by the model. And now we do the training training part, and I'll mm -hmm. do a little and bit more test. test part. Uh, yeah, and now we want to see some uh, results. Yeah, so we can call the same helper function we have to score this model. OK, so now it's actually, yeah. Is this OK? Because doesn't it look exactly the same? But OK, if they weren't the same, it, it... Want to run that one again? Let me see. Yeah, I'll take them here. So I'll see that. I'm... So we have the context one here. So that's 73. No, they're not exactly. No, it's the not the same. They're just, they're, we're not seeing oh, any improvement. No, we're not seeing any improvement. Actually, it's, yeah, they're very close. So, uh, so our feature, our all hard, hard feature engineering work didn't help us much. It, it, so the result here is actually that we have one variable so far that actually predicts the activity in, or the, yeah, the active, active discussions. And it's the, how fast you, you reply. That's, that's the sort of domain level conclusion of this. Um, so far, um, I'm sure we would find much more if we would spend more time on it and dig deeper, and maybe we will. This is this is pretty interesting, and this tool is quite amazing, actually. If you if you look at how you can how elegantly the the, the pipeline is 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 built, and yeah. uh, how you can uh, I like this a lot, actually. This is uh, this is super nice. Um, there are maybe it's not for this talk, but there are a lot of advantages which has to do with if you want to generate programmatically a lot of models and compare these models and collecting statistics of these models and, and using them which when you when you start to do real heavy duty modeling that's that's worth that's a lot right. yeah yeah so um this was it and um it was a nice super nice journey we should mention that um uh, this material was prepared in uh, cooperation with uh, Daniel Slutsky, who also had a workshop. So if you're interested in going a bit more detail into uh, into most of the code that we use today as well, it's it's in that workshop. Um, yeah, and here's a list of the um, libraries that we used. Uh, please uh, research, have a look at them. They are fantastic, and the people uh, behind them are fantastic, and we're very thankful for all the effort they did. They made this journey that we presented today possible. I should add that what is worth stressing here is the simplicity of this approach and the functional op approach, uh, which matters a lot here. There were some details that we skipped in the during the, the baking phase when the, we had the code in the oven, so to say, that require looking into the data and at different levels of granularity, grouping, ungrouping, things that you in the workflow of a data scientist do all the time. And what closure and tablecloth does is that it makes it very easy, which is not obvious at all in other platforms. But also, let me add that this is a constantly evolving ecosystem. People are working on these, and um, uh, yeah, we're always looking for more people to help. Help can be come in the form of writing a library, but 
even more so to organize things, to work on the website, to do all the other kinds of stuff that is necessary for, for this kind of project. So if you're curious about data science, if you're curious about these tools, please join us. Um, Zulip, as we have seen, is the main, main place where we meet. Um, Here also is a, a link for uh, with a repository that has all this code. So if you would like to dig in more deeply, uh, look at some of the, uh, the the code, play around with it, and possibly even run a model that uh, predicts better than ours. That would be great. <laughs> That's not possible. We, we... <laughs> we did work hard. <laughs> we worked hard. Okay, thank you, everyone. This was a blast. Thank Bye -bye. you.